Why don't you turn into 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to get my, uh, my lectern. I'd like to talk this morning about legacy and about birthright. About legacy and about birthright. You may have noticed that our, our race through this world is pretty fast, is it not? It just, we just race, it seems like we wake up and we're kids. And then it's like we go to sleep and we wake up again and we're we've just left home and then we go to sleep and we wake up again and it's our 40th birthday party <laughs> and then we go to sleep and we wake up again and, and we're old and then we go to sleep and we don't wake up again <laughs> other than in glory and it's like life, life just flies past and, and I think you do as you get older one of the things is you do start thinking more about your legacy than about moaning about your, what your birthright was or wasn't you see um, we build upon the birthright, both good and bad, that was given to us by the generation that's gone before, by our parents, by our grandparents. A legacy, a, 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 a le their legacy to us is the birthright that we stand upon. So uh, the, the great generation that fought through the Second World War, their legacy was the birthright of the generation that was born, that was born in the 40s, and from on, on, on from that, the legacy, the, the birthright in uh, uh, women's equality, is largely from the legacy left by uh, uh, the Pankhursts and so on back a generation or two ago. Whatever we look for for our kids, whatever birthright we want for our kids. We have to leave as a legacy yeah. in our lives today. And we leave a legacy that is both positive and negative for our kids to build upon. And some of you have had great legacies. Some of you, have, your birthright was amazing. You know, some of you, you, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. And that's fantastic. I'm so happy for you. Please see me afterwards. <laughs> some of you, your birthright read like something out of a Dickens novel and was, was a series of tragedies and you say, I don't want to leave a birthright like that for my children. I want my children to have something greater and so you work hard to provide a legacy to give your children a birthright. Many years ago I was at the Epcot Center in Disneyland in uh, Florida and there they had a big wall and it was called the Legacy Wall and on that was all the people who had donated money which enabled the Epcot Center to be built. And the Epcot Center was the something prototype city, experimental prototype city of tomorrow. And it was an, a visionary exercise in what tomorrow could be and what tomorrow could look like. I want to challenge you today to have an Epcot imagination yeah. The experimental prototype church of tomorrow, what you see that could be, what you imagine life being like for the next generation and the generation after that. Because it's that right now we are inscribing our names on the legacy wall yeah. that our children will yeah. read from and build on yeah. when we're long gone. Mm. Our birthright, to put a different perspective on this, our uh, birthright comprises of the footprints that have been left in the sands of time by our forefathers. Yeah. And the birthright of the next generation is going to be the footprints that we leave yeah. in the sands of time. And we, every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, from the richest to the poorest, love it or hate it, are leaving Footprints, many of them indelible in the sands of time. We're leaving emotional footprints 
in the lives of every person that we're meeting. We're leaving psychological footprints. We're healing scars and causing scars. We're leaving ecological footprints right now. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. I want to ask this as a church. What footprints are you leaving in the sands of this community of faith? We're really excited that, that we still have... The, there's, there's a few of our original originals still in the church, people like Brenda and Mrs. C, and they're going to be here next week. Uh, and we're thrilled about that. And their footprints, but, but they're part of a generation where almost all the footprints have been washed by the sand, by the tide as it's coming, and the footprints of the people who left the footprints are not there anymore, but we still walk in those footprints. Steve Green wrote a song that said, Oh, may those who come behind us find us faithful. Yeah. And may the power of our devotion light their way. Yeah. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Mm, I want to talk this morning about legacy and birthright. And we're turning to 2 Corinthians Chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, sorry. And the first footprint I want to talk about is the footprint of faith. The footprint of faith. Before we look at this scripture, there was a, a great um, man called, the, called Timothy. And Timothy was Paul the Apostle's great young protege. And Paul writes of Timothy, he says... I first found you and discovered that you were emulating the faith that you found in your grandmother Eunice. Yeah. What an amazing thing that was. A footprint of faith that was in Timothy's life. And we don't know about Timothy's mum and dad and we don't know what they were like. But we know they had, he had a godly grandma. All the godly grandmas said, Amen. Amen. You're putting... You know, your kids might not have turned out okay, but you're putting footprints in the lives of your grandkids because you've got it together now, maybe. I don't know. Thank God for that. But here we have 2 Corinthians 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, Paul says, or need we as some others letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you for you are our epistle or that's the old-fashioned word for letter. You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Paul says, I have a message I'm trying to communicate to the world. God's given me a message and I've communicated it to you and you have become a message, a love letter to the world. And... Uh, very much in any individual church, in the, uh, I'm aware as a pastor, as the person who does the bulk of the teaching here is, is the message which God has given me to bring into the world is that in a sense you are epistles of that as well, yeah. that you have taken that and listened to it over years and, and God has brought you here because this is the message he wants in your life as well. And I make no apologies for that. If, you're, if God's called you here, it's because the particular message God's given me is something which is, he knows is going to be helpful to you. And he wants to take you, you to take that epistle into the world. So Paul says that. And that's wonderful as it, as it is. But then he goes on and he says, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be epistles of Christ. So you're not just epistles of Pastor Tom, you're epistles of much, much greater writer, a far greater penman, a far more profound wordsmith, that of Jesus Christ, who's written letters, and it says on the fleshy tables of your heart, on the, with, the, with the pen of Christ, he's inscribed in your heart a love letter to the world and in our heart. To the world, and then he gathers a bunch of people together because none of us can tell the whole of the letter. And he says, City Praise Centre, I've given you a particular chapter to write, a particular footprint to put in the sands of time. 
And you know, we've been around now for 70, over 70 years as a church. And, and I trust that we'll 70 years time, 170 years time, we'll still be putting footprints. But even if we're not, those footprints will still be visible in our hearts of those who we've impacted and the legacy and birthright chain that goes down throughout the ages. You're part of something far greater than you could possibly know. Amen. It's a footprint of faith. And the footprint of faith has a corporate weight upon it of all the people that are part of this church family. Mm. You may say, oh, I'm only an ear, I'm only a hand, I'm only this, I'm only that. But you, you are part of something which is a corporate expression in the sands of time of Jesus Christ on the earth mm, in the 21st century. You see, I don't want to leave a dead orthodoxy to those who come behind. I don't want people to read my systematic, Pastor Tom's systematic theology. This is what I believe. Part one. And you know, this, this great omnibus of what I believe. I want people to remember my legacy is who I am, not this, this doctrinal statement. Yeah. It's the person. It's the sum of my mistakes and my failures, my successes, my how God's rescued me from disaster and got me back up on my feet again, of how it's the, the sum total of my life becomes God's letter to the world. Yeah. And sometimes you look and you think, well, God, what could I possibly, what could I bring? What footprint could I make? Half the time my footprint looks like I'm dragging my foot. I, I'm doing part of the ministry of City Walks and God says, yes, but, but there are other people who are also dragging their feet. Yeah. There are other people who are not always walking perfectly uprightly like this, yeah. but other people who it looks more like something like this and they're not quite sure what they're doing. And they said, but that's okay because I can find footprints that match mine yeah. and I can be part of that. So never deny, never get upset because your footprint is not the perfect march of a goose-stepping Nazi Christian, but that your, your, you know, this, this ecclesiastical, theological Nazism that goes by the name of Christianity sometimes. Yeah. But that your, your walk with Christ is a genuine walk. Yeah. And sometimes you're trying to catch up and sometimes you're getting behind and, yeah. and that's okay. But other people will put their footprints in yours yeah. and go, this person made it to glory. I wrote to dear old Derek Savage, and Derek, you know Derek who ministers here sometimes, and he's been given about three months to live, and he's coming to the end of his race, and I wrote to him, and I sat down, and I thought, what should I write to this dear, dear brother? And I wrote, my brother, your life has made so many, given so many people so much courage Amen. in the course of their life. Now run for the race, run for the prize. Yeah, As you yeah. see the prize, the, 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 the line in front of you, run for it. People are watching you, run for it. So that when they get to the end of their race, they can say, Brother Derek, he put his foot here, I can put my foot here. Yeah, Brother yeah. Jack, Sister Jackie, she put her foot here, I can put my foot here. In many, many years to come, people can look and they can say, one of the young people are here, oh my goodness, but they had a footprint and I can put my foot there and I'm right up at the swelling of the Jordan and I can smell the, 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 the see the river and I can see the glory land beyond and it's a bit scary I'm not sure but I remember Debbie Bonfron and I remember how courageous she was as she passed over that river and I've got another foot I can footprint I can put my foot in. Amen. Wow, wow. The footprint of faith is our legacy to the next generation and it's their birthright. The second footprint I want us to look at is the footprint, and it's my favourite footprint of the whole lot I, at the moment, is the footprint of the beloved community. The footprint of the community. Let's go to uh, the Psalms now. Psalm 83, 84. Psalm 84.
You see, we, we often think in our very secular society, our society where it's all about me, it's all about I, it's all about what I am going to be and I'm going to do. And we see our footprint of faith as being something which uh, I'm leaving. But it's not, it's something we leave. It's a community mm -hmm. action. Yes. And Psalm 84 says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And this has become one of the key scriptures in my life for probably 30 years now. Yea, the sparrow has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars. The community of faith, the place where the sparrows can come. We've got all sorts of wildlife out in our garden. We love, we've got bushes where the sparrows live and we've got places where the, the, uh, the blackbirds are and the, the, the robin has his tree and uh, the little mice, they've got their place, we've got two little nests of mice. Uh, at least we think there's two nests, we're not sure. There's, a, there's, there's one family which is descended from um, uh, brave Sir Basil. <laughs> who was eaten by a sparrow hawk about this time last year. But his, his kids survived. And uh, so Basil Jr. Is, is now raising his family in that nest. And that's lovely. And we love that. We love that. There's something so, so the cutesy about that. And I think that's what David's saying here. He's saying, look, the sparrow, and I guess he was outside the temple. And he was looking at it, and it wasn't the temple wasn't this great glass structure where there wasn't anything for a wildlife. No, but he was looking at the sparrows making their their nest in the crevices and cracks of the temple. Perhaps part of the temple that had fallen into a bit of disrepair, and and a brick had fallen out, and some sparrows had got in there. And how wonderful that is! And God designs the world like that. You know, old trees. And they, they're all gnarly and branches have fallen off. And, but that's okay because it's that, that gnarling of the tree, that twisting, that breaking off of branches that creates little bowls in the tree where the sparrows come and make their nest, and which encourages great biodiversity and, and, and so on. And, and, and Jesus, you know, this scripture even says that his eye is on the sparrow. Mm, yeah. God watches the sparrows. If you want to be like God, Watch the sparrows. If he's good enough for God, he's going to teach you something about that. But he says, in the house of God, even the sparrows are here. They say, man, my life. It looks the temple's falling into disrepair. There's a brick missing here. There's a brick missing there. But maybe there's a sparrow lodging in there. You know, in churches, just so slick and so perfect, there's often no room for, for the sparrows. We want this church to be a place for the sparrows. It's a footprint of... Community. I have in many ways an overwhelming compulsion to build a community, to build a place that people can call home. This tribe, this village, this family, this city set on a hill, this group of brothers and sisters. Now, I understand not everybody's going to stay here. God might call you somewhere else or whatever. But, but home, the knowledge of home, of strong home, it gives, it, as a child, it gives you the, the ability to spread your wings because you know you can go home. You know? Uh, Sam's back living with us half of the week. And uh, there's something strong about that, that sense of there is, a, there is home. There's a place. The birds may migrate for the winter, but they come back home. Mm goldfinches, they go to South Africa in the winter, but they always come back to our garden. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because they know there's food there, there's home, there's a place for them. It's a place where they say here, where the birds may lay her young, and I love this, even on the altar. I wonder what would happen in your average high church, if you came in one morning and found that some pigeons were on the high altar. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, you know, pigeons are like, we get pigeons in our garden. I'm not even going to go there with the pigeons. No. <laughs> and they've, you know, they've pooped all over the altar and they've got their, I don't know, but, but David says, look, even, even, even on the altar, <laughs> it's a messy place. Families are like that, aren't they? Mm. Mm. That's what we want church to be. A footprint. As part of the legacy we leave for our children and the birthright, your children are so blessed if they grow up in this church. Mm. I'll tell you that, they are blessed. Because most kids don't have that opportunity to have brothers and sisters, so many. You children here, you are blessed. I know sometimes you might think, oh, I don't want to go to church, or oh, I go there, they hug me, and they do this, and they just <laughs> say, you know. Um, but you're so blessed that your parents bring you here because you've got family, you've got people that, who will look out for you for the rest of your life. You've got people when you're when you're in trouble. When you, I know at the moment you think oh, I've never been in trouble, I won't go out. But there'll be people here who'll watch over you. Yeah. There'll be people here who are going to pray for you all of your life through. <laughs> there are people here who, when when difficulties come, will. People are here who will open doors for you. Yeah. I thank God for the people here who have opened doors for my kids in, 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 uh, in business or in other, other areas, who have taught them skill sets, who have shown the way, who have, who have when, when I haven't known what to do, I haven't been a good father, has come along and been a great father example. Home gives you a security of a place to return to. I remember some of my best memories are being 18, 19 years old at my church Beaconsfield and it was a small church, it was about a 70 or 80 people, it was a house church, very very community based, uh, I mean everybody pretty much lived with each other, I lived with a family in the church and, and the, the memories of working together of, for instance, when we moved into a move like this, everybody would just take the week off and just be there. If the roof blew off somebody's house, everybody would take time off and go there and put the roof back on. It was just the way, mm. way we did life. And those memories, and even to this day, we, the church is, is just a, a very small group of people still meeting now. Everybody, the pastor retired, everybody <laughs> went and did their own thing, moved across the country. But we still have a Facebook page. And people still are throwing on pictures on there and saying, do you remember this? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember when we put up Put, put, put down a new floor. I remember when we landscaped the garden, the house, and, and we did all these things together. And, and there's that huge warmth. That's a legacy. That's a legacy that Andy Hunter's dream, Andy and Margie Hunter, bless them, their dream and their footprint enabled me to put my footprint. And, and now that footprint is a footprint which you guys are building on. But it's not my footprint. I just put my footprint in Andy Hunter's footprint. And he put his foot in somebody else's footprint, going right the way back. It's legacy. It's birthright. Go to Psalm 87. And you'll see it again. Psalm 87, verse 5. And of Zion it shall be said, this one, that one was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writes up the people that this one and that one was born there. Let me just do a little, if you were born in this church, I don't mean literally, you know, but if you were born in this church, Either if you were either born again in this church, this is where you were born again, or if you were physically born in this church, give me a wave now. Isn't that wonderful? That's beautiful, isn't it? Wonderful. And isn't it, did you notice how, how those who were born in the house are near the front? <laughs> all the kids, they're all here, they're like, because ah. it's for you that we're building more things. Yes. That's, our, that's our legacy to you. Yeah. That will be, I mean, we're going to be around for a bit longer, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our legacy to you. That's, our, that's your birthright. We're giving you that. That's why we, we put in a, a 36,000 watt PA system. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> it's a 36,000. That's why we had the base bins changed, altered in the, at the manufacturer, 
so that you can play your drum and bass and you know the music with the big drops and all the dubstep stuff, all that, the stuff which, which you drop so low that you can't hear it, but you can feel it. We've had the speakers also so they can play this stuff through there. Now I know by the time we move in probably they'll be listening to something else, but the principle's there. You know, we didn't think, hey, you know, we're all into Gaither, let's make music, make, put a PA system suitable for that. Like, but Peter, he says, look, look, this person, they were born here. They were born here, they were born here, they were born here. For the rest of your life, wherever you go in your life, you will have friends and you'll go, man, I was born there. And when we do things, perhaps we do, we move to another place or another place and everybody gathers. You'll be one of the ones gathering back say, I'm going to be there, whatever it takes. Because I'm walking in those footprints. Third footprint is the that we are all going to leave, and this is becoming more and more important, is the ecological footprint every one of us leaves. This ecological legacy. The ecological legacy, turn to the book of Revelation. The ecological legacy of this generation, and this is where it gets serious, could spell the destruction of the next. There are some... some really frightening things happening right now. And I'm glad we're not burying our head in the sand. I'm glad we're starting to wake up to it. Um, The North American Indians, when they had their meetings and they would discuss the future and what to do, they would always discuss what every decision, the implications of every decision would have over the next seven generations. They were thinking, three or four hundred years in the future, if we hunt the buffalo to extinction here, what effect will that have on the generation, three generations time? That's something we have entirely lost, the ability to think past our own generation, we're such so selfish. I remember being, uh, hearing so many people, uh, and still today you sometimes hear people talking about uh, Christians saying, well, it doesn't matter about ecology, it doesn't matter about that stuff, because God will just give us a new heavens and a new earth. Well, actual fact, it says in the book of Revelation, and, and uh, I'm going to read this out in the King James Version, because it comes across much better in this, in chapter 10, verse 18, it says, and the nations were angry, oh boy, are the nations angry today? And the nations were angry, and your wrath had come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and unto the saints, and unto them that fear thy name, small and great, that thou shouldst destroy them that destroy the earth. Oh, that's serious, isn't it? Now that's not a legacy I want to leave my kids. I think there's still a lot of denial on these things, particularly in Christian circles. We show our liberty by driving something which is going to destroy the world. I, 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 I don't know if many of you uh, remember what it was like in the summers back in when you first started driving, how you were constantly clearing bugs off your front windshield. Do you remember that? Mm. Oh, just forever, bugs were on the windshield. Just a mess. When was the last time you ever needed to do that? Have you ever noticed that? Mm. You don't need to do that anymore. Do you know why? Because in the last 40 years, we've lost (coughs) 70% of the flying insects in Europe. 70% have gone. Do you know what happens if that reaches 90%? Everything dies. Everything. Everything dies. Because it's those insects that pollinate the plants. Mm. You see, our plants, we can say, oh, I don't need insects to pollinate plants, I go to Sainsbury's. <laughs> Without insects to pollinate the plants, everything dies. Mm-hmm. Africa's due to lose 30% of its usable water over the next 40 years. You say, well, that's okay, I live in the UK. Yeah, but hey, if Africa loses 40% of its water, where do you think the entire population of Africa is coming? Hmm? I mean, I don't look at this church, but most of them here. (laughs) (laughs) Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. 
if we look at Asia and we find that, that um, uh, within the next 20 years, they will run out of fish in Asia. Where do you think they're going to be fishing? You see, popula population just moves. You know, English people don't own England. African people don't own Africa. We're children of the world. The whole thing's been given to us. It's not for us to sit and say, well, this is my nation, this is my country, you can't come. No. If, if people will go to where the food is. And where every, if we're so interconnected. Everything that we do here affects everything everywhere else yeah. in the world. You can't fart without it affecting the world. <laughs> Seriously, this is true. Without it affecting somewhere over here because you just contributed to global warming. <laughs> Don't mock me when I'm preaching good. <laughs> Don't use that word, children. I just realised the kids are in here, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Break wind. Break wind. Everything you do... I'm sorry, Linda. Everything you do... Everything you do has a knock-on effect in this world. And, and the, the legacy we lead, leave is the birthright our children has to... Mm. Has to uh, Clear up. Yeah. Just close your eyes and breathe for me. Let me bring this home. Because you, you know, we get so we, we read all this stuff on Sky News and we don't get it home. Just take a deep breath and breathe out. Now, as you breathe in, what are you breathing in? On the air, and you're taking out the oxygen. You need oxygen, right? Yeah. And as you breathe out, what are you breathing out? Carbon dioxide, you don't need that, that's poisonous to you, you're breathing it out. Now as you breathe out, what's breathing in the carbon dioxide? Trees, thank you, trees. Trees are breathing in, so I want you to imagine as you breathe out, you're exhaling carbon dioxide and the trees are breathing in that carbon dioxide, because that's what they need. And then what does a tree breathe out? Oxygen. Oxygen. So as the tree exhales, you inhale, and as you exhale, the tree inhales. Just breathe a few more times. Imagine it in your mind's eye, see this happening. This is literally what happens, okay? What happens now if you cut down the trees? Imagine what it would be like for you to live on only one lung. How would that feel like? How would that change your life? You see, a sudden revelation comes now is that half of my respiratory system is hanging on the trees. Mm, yeah. I cut down the trees, I just stop myself breathing. <coughs> so crazy are we, so self-obsessed that we've missed this point. And the, the legacy we leave is the birthright of the next generation. And I don't want to leave a Mad Max kind of birthright to the next generation. May it be that this generation is the one generation in living memory that leaves it better ecologically than the one we left behind. Mm, Our consumer culture is absolutely unsustainable. And we have to, and this is why I'm talking to the church about this, is church is uniquely placed to experiment with alternative lifestyles and ways of doing and being together that cuts down our footprint so that we can so become sustainable. God has designed nature to be such a way that if any species becomes too dominant and threatens the, the biodiversity of the whole, it will cull that species. Now we're staying a step ahead simply by the deployment of ever-increasing methods of technology, which are technological fixes to try and undo the damage that the last technological fix caused. But nature will get to the point when it overtakes us. Don't think it won't. Don't say, oh, we're Christians. It won't do. The Black Death killed Christians and non-Christians alike. Mm. <coughs> Scary stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Let me read you this. This is from John Landier, who was a Sioux Indian chief. Before our white brothers came to civilise us, we had no jails. Therefore, we had no criminals. You can't have criminals without a jail. Mm. We had no locks or keys, and so we had no thieves. 
If, an, uh, if a man was so poor that he had no house or teepee or blanket, someone gave him those things because without those things, he couldn't contribute to society. We were too uncivilized to set much value on personal belongings. We wanted to have things only in order to give them away. We had no money and therefore a man's worth couldn't be measured by it. We had no written law, no attorneys or politicians, therefore we couldn't cheat. We really were in a bad way before the white man came. And I don't know how we managed to get along without these basic things, because we are told they are absolutely necessary to make a civilised society. So writes John Lane Deer. One of the things which is big in our hearts as a church is how we do bold experiments in the next 10, 20 years that to, in community to be able to live together in ways which are sustainable. Watch this space, there are people thinking this through, praying this through, working this through right now. It's going to change everything. And if it doesn't change everything, there'll be nothing for the next generation. Let me close with something a bit more exciting and a bit more uplifting. The fourth footprint we want to leave is a territorial footprint. Turn to Joshua chapter 24. Territorial footprint. I thank God for the territory that was, given, that, was, that was given to us by the faith of the generations before that purchased base camp, that erected there a church building. I remember when I came here, and it was dear old Dave, Pastor Dave Puddle. And he said, there's a church there and they need a pastor. Let me see if I can get you in to preach because maybe they'll like you. <laughs> and I said, what's it like? He said, it's great. They've even got their own building. The roof is good. And if you're an Anglican minister here, you'll know that's the first, that's not the first question you ask when you're looking at a new church. You say, what's the roof like? Yeah. And they said, and they've even got a band. There you go. And uh, I was, I'm glad for that. And one of the things we want to do is leave some territories, to leave, leave some stuff. And this is the last, least most important thing. That's why it's the last point. But it's still important. It's still important. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is at the end of his life. And he says this, I have given you a land for which you did not labour and cities which you did not build, to, to dwell, and you dwell in them, and you eat of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. And that's the scripture God gave us when we first saw the Maltings. I'm giving you homes that you did not build. Mm. When we first went into the Maltings 12 years ago, about 12 years ago, it was derelict. We would never have been able to do anything with it. And God brought another company along. Another tribe came in and they perfectly decorated it for us. And they <laughs> divided it up in a way we could not, never have imagined. But it's absolutely perfect. We couldn't have done it more perfectly. God was in the mix. God was saying to their architects, they went to the architects and they said, we want this to be a suite of offices and we want this to be good for business. And God was in the architect's mind saying, oh no, I've got plans for the Maltings. Yeah. He said, I want a children's room there. I want a crash area here. I want some offices up here. I want some areas where they can get together and cook here. I want areas where they can chill out there. And the architect's going, oh, okay, I'll do that. I understand it. And he says, I want a big barn out the back where they can go in. And I want some big beams overhead where they can hang big speakers off of it. And I want a mezzanine floor upstairs where they can use them. And then, see, we didn't understand. We didn't know this. But God was saying, I'm preparing for you a home that you didn't build. Joshua is speaking at the end of his life and he's saying, look, look, this is what we had. But if you rewind to the beginning of the book of Joshua, he says exactly the same thing. In chapter one, he says, we are going in. We are going in. And it's a land. And in there, there's cities which you have not built. In that land, there's, there's vineyards which you did not plant. And at the end of his life, and at the end of all of our lives, we'll look back and we'll be able to say, I remember. <laughs> We went 
into the maltings. And I remember that that was a city. And do you remember old Pastor Tom? Oh, yes. He said there was a city. I'm sure there's a video of this on there. There was cities. But we're not there yet, are we? No. We listen. And you're a young Pastor Tom. Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying we're going into a land. Yeah. There's cities we did not build and we're going in. Yeah. There's vineyards we did. Is there vineyards? Well, there vineyards. Come on. There will be prophetically vineyards. Amen. There's car parks we did not build. There's an auditorium we did not make. There is, you know, wow. Woo! We're going in. Are you packed? Have you got your stuff all packed? Are you ready for this? You see, there is... There, the, there's a principle in farming and, and oh, what's his name? Oh, all creatures great and small. James Herriot. James Herriot. One of his books, he talks there about, he turns up as a, as a young uh, veterinary surgeon and he's up in the hills of uh, Yorkshire and he sees this farmer with a wheelbarrow and he's an elderly farmer and he's picking stones out of the out of his field and putting them into the wheelbarrow and he says you shouldn't be picking stones out of this field at your age he said my grand my father picked stones out of this field and it made it easier for me to dig he said my grandfather picked stones out of this field and it made it easier for my father to dig he said and i picked stones out of this field so that my sons have a field that's easier to dig Right now, we're doing all sorts of stuff at base camp. We're, we're just picking stones out to make it easier for the next generation to dig. See, farmers don't farm for their generation. Farmers famously farm for their sons. When we go into the maltings next week, one of the things we're going to be doing, and we're going to be doing this over a number of different times, we're going to be taking up some really big offerings. And I want you to, I want to challenge you. But to, to come next week, if you're a regular, if you're part of the family, come next week with an offering which is significant one where you're saying, I'm so I'm 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 farming here, I'm sowing seed for my sons and for my daughters, for the sparrows that are gonna find a nest in the house. I'm sowing my seed for the children, for the, those that shall be born there, of this one and that one. It was said they were born in Zion as well. They came to birth at the Maltings as well. You see, your wealth is better used to build a village that your children can call home than to build a trust fund that the government can call income tax. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Far better that you build a family, a large family, than you build on one, a shaky foundation. You see, my... My children, I, I don't have a huge amount to, to pass on to my kids. Um, we own a one-bedroom flat, that's it. A, a five-year-old car and a lot of books. I, I don't have a huge amount we're going to be passing on. But I have something which is greater than it all. And I hope my kids will hear this and understand this. My children will always have here... I hope they'll always have here a huge family. They'll always have a refuge here when I'm long gone. That my children's children will have a refuge here. My great-grandchildren, when I'm just a memory, will have a, re a home here because I was part of a community. I put my foot in the footprints with others, hundreds and hundreds of other people. And we formed something and built something, a footprint of faith, a footprint of community, a footprint of family, a footprint of territory. And this is my bequest to my kids. This is my legacy. You are my legacy to my kids in that sense. But more than that, this is their birthright. And it's exactly the same for your children as well. Your children are the same. Those of you who are particularly who have given your life into this place. Let them know that. Let them know this is their birthright. Now I might not be able to give you very much when I die. 
but I'm giving you something that the world cannot give. I'm giving you a family. I'm giving you a community of faith. And when you look out, you could never have built this yourself. There's black, there's white, there's rich, there's poor, there's professionals, there's those who are uh, man, uh, skilled manual workers. There's, there's elderly people who have taught us what it is to run the race in the end. There are young people who are teaching us how to dance again. <laughs> this is the beloved community. This is our legacy. This is our birthright. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this chapter that we've co-written here. We thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, that together we've written something which, which is in your book, Lord. It's in your book. And all the books on earth are gone. In that book, we've written something. And as we turn over, we find a whole new clean page. Lord, give us the faith to write on it, to inscribe on it, and to be inscribed upon as as living epistles on the living tablets of our heart. Write your love letter to this world upon us, we pray, as individuals and more importantly as part of this community. Everybody said, Amen. God bless you all. It's been a pleasure to to be here to do this. And uh, <laughs> let's give these guys a round of applause. The, the musicians, the musicians, the circus, the time of the year. All those who served in the kids' work upstairs. Next week we will see you in the Maltings as we start a new chapter.